Uh, have, have you ever noticed that you, you can hardly go anywhere without someone taking pictures, right? Without accidentally, you know, photobombing some tourist vacation snapshot. You know, you're, you're, you're in the middle of some great thing that they won't remember. You're looking like a dork. You know, it's just kind of like, oh, there I am. And, you know, and it, it got me to thinking about how people down through the centuries would capture important moments. You know, early on, the most significant events would only remember, be remembered by words, you know, oral tradition. And then people began to draw pictures. You know, first on cave walls, then stone, then on canvas. But still, the process was time-consuming. It took a long time. And then in 1822, the camera was invented. And the tedious chore of getting a visual record went from weeks down to hours. And cameras got smaller. They went from those box-like behemoths you know, that we had down to Kodak cameras, to Polaroid cameras, right? That gave you pictures in seconds. And then we decided to stick on our phones, or stick phones on our cameras. I'm, I'm not sure which. Uh, OK. A whole new wave of capturing our moments, you know, swept over us. I mean, we capture everything, right? Every event, even our food. You know? Yeah. But we don't stop there, do we? We post it on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok for everyone to see whether they want to or not. But at the peak of photographic evolution is the selfie. Phones have cameras that make it look like you're taking a picture of someone else, but you're really taking a picture of who? Yeah. Yourself, right? This morning, and continuing for the next two seconds, I, I want to help us capture some of the moments of Easter. Now, we won't be using phones or cameras, and we'll certainly not be taking selfies. Instead, we're going to use John the Apostle's account of these historical events. Now, during Easter, it's really trendy for pastors to preach about Jesus' physical sufferings of the cross. You know, some will give you a complete medical description of, of what Jesus experienced. And it makes for sensational preaching, but it misses the point. You see, in every gospel account of Jesus' death by crucifixion, little time is spent on the details of his physical suffering. They're almost like footnotes to the story. In the New Testament letters, the, the, the emphasis shifts to the meaning of the death of Jesus. And that's what I want to help us capture in the next three weeks. I want us to see the pictures that John takes at the cross. And I want us to be able to know deep down inside why Jesus died, how that affects each one of us. So if you have your Bible this morning, whether you got it on your phone like I do or, or, or wherever, go ahead and turn with me to John 19, verse 16. John 19, 16. Or you can follow along in the outline that's in your uh, bulletin, the sermon notes there. And it's here that we're going to pick up the description, John's description of Jesus' death. Now, why is this important? Because John was the only gospel writer who was there at the crucifixion. He doesn't give a detailed account, but he captures these moments pictures, and that's what we're going to look like, and six pictures. And we find the first picture in John 19, 6. We can call it the, the, the 1916. We can call it the crucifixion. It reads like this. So he, talking about Pontius Pilate, then handed him, Jesus, over to be crucified. Now notice, John, John doesn't linger on the details of how this execution was accomplished. But I think we can sum it up in the words of that great Roman orator, Marcus Tullius Cicero who said this, he, he said, quote, even the mere word cross must remain far from the lips of the citizens of Rome, but also from their thoughts, their eyes, and their ears. See, no Roman could be put to death by crucifixion because it was so horrible. Look at verse 17. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, 
which is in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, with him two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. Now, this was the Roman practice. The Roman practice was maximum amount of humiliation. The condemned would have to carry the cross beam, and Jesus had to carry it from the palace of Pilate all the way across Jerusalem and outside the city. And we know from other gospel accounts that Jesus had been so brutally beaten that he faltered, and an onlooker, Simon of Cyrene, was drafted from the crowd to carry it. Now, we're not sure of the exact place of, the, of this execution, although if you travel to Israel today, they'll tell you exactly where it is for a small fee. Um, but we're not exactly sure, but it was well known to the people of Jerusalem because it was in the area of the city garbage dump. And there, this rude cross was nailed together. Jesus is thrown down on it. His limbs are outstretched. They nail his hands and his feet to it. The cross is then lifted into position and allowed to slam down into the hole that had been prepared for it. That's the first picture. The second picture, let's call this picture, call this one the inscription. In verse 19, Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Now, it was also the custom of, of Rome, especially in Judea, to put a sign over the heads of crucified criminals. The sign would detail the crimes for which they were being punished. This was a deterrent to wrongdoing. They figure, gosh, if you know, we do it enough times, they'll get the message. And probably at no other time did Pontius Pilate get involved with an execution to this depth. And as you can imagine... This set off the Jewish religious leaders. Look at verse 20. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write, The King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written... I have written. Now notice again, John points out the place of the execution near the city. And in, in addition, Paul has the inscri- uh, Pilate has the inscription written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Now you may think, well, why those three languages? Hebrew was the language of the Jews. Latin was the language of the Romans. And Greek, Greek was the lingua franca, the, the, the trade language. Almost everybody understood Greek. So what does that mean? That meant every literate individual would know what was happening. They could read it. Or if they, if they weren't literate, they could nudge a friend saying, hey, what does that say? And so the religious leaders tried to get Pilate to qualify the inscription with a more you know, politically correct version. But something in Pilate made him stiffen his spine. He says, no, we're going to leave it in its original version. The king of the Jews. The third picture that John brings up. We can call this one the people at the cross. Look at verse 23. It says, Then the soldiers, John writes, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to decide whose it shall be. And this was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments, among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now there are two groups of people that catch Jesus' attention while he's hanging on the cross. We know from John's words that four soldiers had been assigned to this duty as executioners. And it was common practice to give the clothing of the condemned to the soldiers who performed this grisly task. It was kind of like a tip. I guess. Because most criminals of Rome, in addition addition to the physical pain, were crucified naked or with a small loincloth so that there would be maximum humiliation. And so the soldiers parceled out Jesus' clothing, his sandals, his outer cloak, his belt, his headband. You know, they they rolled dice. They they cast a lot for, for that. But when they came to the tunic, the garment that's worn inside the cloak, they found it to be good enough workmanship that rather than divide it, they gambled for it. Now, we may think, why, 
John, why did you mention this detail? <laughs> of all the things you could have mentioned, why this? Well, John puts it in its proper context. See, it's not only because of custom, but it's also because of prophecy. See, John, John was reminded of the words of the Messianic Psalm, Psalm 22, written almost a thousand years before. Many of the words would be familiar to these individuals standing around the cross. The psalmist writes, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All who see me sneer at me. They separate the lip. Literally, that means make mouths at me. They make faces at me. They wag their heads saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, a, a broken piece of pottery, brittle. And my tongue cleaves to my jaw, and you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil doers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast <coughs> lots. The soldiers, the first group. But along with the soldiers, there was a second group of people at the cross. Look at the end of verse 25. John writes, but standing at the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold, your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. So who's in this second group, okay? You've got Mary, okay, Jesus' mother, his mother's sister, which would be Jesus' aunt. Some scholars identify her as the mother of James and John. There's Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And it's interesting, while Jesus ignores the soldiers, he takes time in this agony to commit his mother to the care of John. And by the way, the, the word translated there, mother, is not as harsh as, a, a woman is not as harsh as it, it sounds. It's a really kind of an endearing term. John's the only writer to capture this exchange. And again, why? It's the fulfillment of what was said over 30 years before. Think about it. Luke chapter 2. Remember when Mary and Joseph took the baby Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem? Luke 2 says that the, their trek to the temple to dedicate the baby Jesus is interrupted by an old man. Simeon had been told by God that he, he would not see death until he had seen the Messiah. And so Simeon spies his family, he sees the baby, and God just reaffirms in him something. And he takes the infant Jesus in his arms, and he speaks a blessing over him and over his parents. And then he said this to Mary in Luke 2.34. He said, This child will be rejected by many in Israel, and it will be their undoing. But he will be the greatest joy to many others. Thus the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. Addressing Mary. Now, the next picture that John brings up is kind of, we can call this the culmination, because it's set off by what comes before it and what comes after it. Look at verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. And a jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop, brought it up to his mouth. And therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What are we saying here? Everything's now in place. Everything is where it's supposed to be. All the parts are in the right place. And if we harmonize all the gospel accounts, just before this picture that John gives us, Jesus had uttered these defining words as recorded in Mark 27, 45. Matthew writes, now from the sixth hour Darkness fell, that's noon. Fell upon all the land until the ninth hour, three. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, 
Why have you forsaken me? Now this is critical because this is the only time in his earthly life that Jesus did not refer to God as his father. It was here for the only time in eternity that the son was separated from the father. And it was here that my phone is going off. I am so sorry. Shh. I didn't promise these people, all of them pizza like last time. No, what happened, what happened last time at another church, I jokingly told everybody, if a phone goes off, you have to buy pizza for everybody. And the very next Sunday, my youngest son calls me right in the middle of the sermon. Fortunately, it was a very small church. <laughs> wow. We love you, Dad. Some of you, this is the only thing you're going to remember, aren't you? <laughs> okay, grab where we can. Okay. Again, going back, it, you know, it's the only time the son is separated from the father. It's the only time Jesus doesn't refer to God as the father. It was here that what had separated all humanity from God, which was our sin, is now separating God the Father from his Son. Jesus is taking the penalty for our sins on himself. And the thirst here is not for, for drugs. You're not for, uh, remember at the beginning of the crucifixion, some of the other gospel accounts say that he was offered some, some almost soporific, some drugs uh, to dull the pain, and he wouldn't take it. I believe this was to clear his lips and his throat for his final statement. It is finished. That's really one word in Greek. It's the word tetelestai. It's a really interesting word to utter at the moment of his greatest agony. Because it was not a word that referred to the ordeal of his execution. It was a term that came from all places, finance and banking. It was a word that was stamped on a deed of land when the last payment had been made. It's finished. It's paid in full. And all that Jesus came to do through his birth, his life, his death was now accomplished. The debt that we incurred because of sin had been marked, paid in full. And it's then and only then that we read that Jesus gave up his spirit. John's not finished. He has two other pictures. The next picture we could call the evidence. This was the skeptical, this was for the skeptical questions that might be asked by future generations. Look at verse 31. Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they may be taken away. So what do we have here? The Jewish religious leaders, they're in a hurry. They had already wasted enough of their Passover, and the Sabbath is merely three hours away. So they're urging Pilate, let's make sure these three guys are dead by breaking their legs. Okay? And, and, and you, you may have heard this, that, that what happens when you're up on that cross, you're hung by the, the nails or the ropes and, and by the nails of your feet, and there was a little seat that you, you could sit on, but that only prolonged the agony because the weight was on your shoulders. It would collapse your your, your, your uh, chest bones and stuff, and, and you would asphyxiate. And so you'd push up on it. And so to get the execution older, over, they would break the legs of the criminals so they couldn't push up. Verse 32 reads, So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. Now, John says here that when the soldiers came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. Let me add something here, okay? These guys knew what death looked like, okay? They were, <laughs> they, they were Roman soldiers. They knew what death looked like. It's not as if they went to the other two men and then missed Jesus. And to make sure, one of them stabs Jesus with his spear. Now, many preachers, again, scrape the Milky Way with comments about these gestures. 
The reality is that what John wanted his readers, what John wanted us to know, that Jesus was really dead. He didn't swoon. He didn't faint. It wasn't as some later wrote, you know, it wasn't Simon of Cyrene on the cross. It was Jesus the Messiah. And all these actions were predicted hundreds and thousands of years before. Exodus 12, Numbers 9, Psalm 34, Zechariah 12. And it's right here that John makes this little parenthetical comment in verse 35. He says, and he who has seen has testified, his testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth so that you also may believe. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. That's Psalm 34. And again, another scripture says, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. That's Zechariah 12.10. Finally, there's the burial. That's the last picture. Verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Joseph of Arimathea, he's a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council. And he's, a, he's also a political operative. He's, he's an acquaintance of Pilate. And so he screws up courage, goes and asks Pilate for the body of Jesus. Normally what happened with criminals who were crucified, they were just dumped in a common grave. But Joseph goes and asks. Then verse 39, Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred weight. And so they took the body of Jesus, bound him in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now, you may remember Nicodemus. Remember, we were first introduced to him in John chapter 3. He came to Jesus by night to ask questions. And later in John 7, Nicodemus defends Jesus in front of the Sanhedrin. So he brings the burial spices to the nearby tomb. Now, why, why is that important? Because the, the, the Jews didn't do like the Egyptians did. The Egyptians embalmed. You know, they took out all the inner organs. The Jews, they would just straighten out the body and they start wrapping it with wrappings, linen wrappings. And what they do is they'd wrap and they put some of those spices to kind of hold off the decay and the, the smell. And they would wrap it and wrap it and wrap it very gently. Verse 41. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. What if the book of John had ended there? Yeah. Yeah. We who have the hope of the resurrection of Jesus, what do we want to do? We want to rush on at this point, right? No, wait, there's more. <laughs> but just for this week, rather than rushing on to the resurrection... Let's linger here for some of the most soul-stirring aspects of the New Testament. What exactly did the death of Jesus accomplish? If he really was Lord and not liar or lunatic, what did the cross bring to, to us, to humanity? Now, the answer to that question takes a lifetime to unpack, but in the remaining minutes, I want to give you a sense of what the death of Jesus does for we who trust in him. Paul writes this in Romans 6, 3. He writes... Do you not know, don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Now, this is a Baptist church, and when a preacher says baptized, what do you think of? Water, right? Yeah, put them all the way under, bring them all the way up, you know. And don't put them under and talk. I mean, bring them up immediately, Okay. <laughs> But really what happens, the, the, the word baptized is just a Greek word taken over in English. It's the Greek word baptizo. And baptizo is not even a religious term. It's a term from the textile industry. And the word means to immerse so as to identify. If I was taking a white piece of cloth and I wanted to dye it red, I would dip it into a vat of red dye and I would pull it out. It would not be a white cloth with red dye on it. The red dye would be profused through it. It would be a red cloth. And so that's the idea here. Don't you know that all of us who have been placed into Jesus Christ, identified with him, have been placed into his death. Therefore, we've been buried with him through this being placed into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead 
through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Okay? The word newness of life means a new quality of life, a new way of doing things. I won't ask for a show of hands who've had joint replacements. I've had two. And you know what the good thing about joint replacements is? You can actually do something. I can actually pick up my golf ball from out of the hole when I chip it in from off the green. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that, yeah. I spend much more time there. And it's kind of a new kind of life because before it was always kind of like, you know, you drop something and I dropped something. It was kind of like, where's Judy? Hey, hon, come here. I kick it over to her and, you know, you know. And, and so the, there's this new quality of life. And then he goes on in verse five. He says, for if, since we've become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, knowing what? Our old self, our old way of doing things, our old system of operation was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be done away with. A better translation there is, it might be rendered inoperative, that we don't have to respond anymore. So we would no longer be slaves to sin, for the one who has died is free from sin. So the overarching principle is this, is that when you trust your life to Jesus Christ, you become identified with him in all that he does. We're united with Christ in his life, death, burial, and resurrection. That means whatever these things imply, they apply to you. So what did the death of Jesus do? Let's wrap up with this. Number one, Jesus took our sins on himself. Peter writes, he personally carried away our sins in his own body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin. We don't have to respond to it anymore and live for what is right. You've been healed by his wounds. Jesus became our substitute. And Paul says something similar in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He says, God made Jesus, the Father made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. We might have a right relationship with him. Now, this makes people uncomfortable. Why? Because the first thing they say is, it's not fair. Why should someone who didn't do anything wrong be punished in my place? I don't accept that. It's not fair. Can I say this to you? Fairness has nothing to do with it. Grace has everything to do with it. Okay? Fairness says you all get treated equal. And as the Queen of Hearts said, off with their heads. But grace, when we know what God's grace is, when we allow ourselves to experience, everything changes. Because get this, the gospel changes everything. The gospel is just not a bunch of facts that you accede to, that you say, okay, I believe those, and you go on. It changes every aspect of life. Jesus took our sins on himself. Number two, Jesus canceled the penalty for our sins. In Colossians, he says, when you were dead, unresponsive in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sin, having canceled, the better translation is, the certificate of debt. Having canceled the certificate of debt with its regulation that was against us, that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. Romans 6.23 tells us that the penalty for sin is death. It's separation from God. I love what one scholar wrote. He said, that penalty is still in, in effect. It was not unused. It was just canceled for you who trust in Jesus. Because Jesus took the penalty for our sins on himself. That's why the word to telestai is so important. It's finished. The debt you and I owe has been paid in full. Someone noted it's kind of like a judge who declares you guilty and then comes down from the bench, takes off his or her robes, and then pays your fine. Do you deserve it? No. Do you want it? Yes. A third thing is that Jesus reconciled us with the Father. In Colossians 1.19, 
Paul writes, for God the Father was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, in Jesus, and through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through Jesus' blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God the Father, you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now the Father has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish, free from accusation. See, the Bible portrays that one of the results of sin is an estrangement from God, a a, a separation, a divorce. Not only are we alienated from God, but we're at war with him. And some of you have had this experience. Imagine an angry adult child who walks out on the family. Where does your heart go? With that child, that adult child. But it's God through Jesus who makes it possible for us to get back together with God. Because what is that kid out there thinking? I'll tell you what he's thinking. It's Luke chapter 15. I screwed up. My parents will never accept me back. I can't come home. I know what I'll do. I'll go to my dad and I'll say, Father, I sinned against heaven in your sight. Make me like one of your hired slaves. And he came back. What did the father say? Yeah. You're a rotten kid. You don't deserve my love. And the father saw him afar off and ran to him and hugged him and kissed him repeatedly and said, come, let's kill the fatted calf. Let's have a party. Bring the robe, bring the family robe that had the family colors. Put it on him. He's my son. Bring the signet ring that shows that he's part of the family. He can do business for the family because he's with us. A fourth thing is that the cross, Jesus demonstrated the Father's love. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Remember Romans 5, 6? You see it just at the right time, Paul writes, while we were still powerless, the word means weak, Christ died for the ungodly. Those who shook their fist at God. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, a nice person. Uh, For a good man, as someone who does good things, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love to us. The word that we translate demonstrate also means recommends, okay? I am an infomercial junkie. When I get too wound up, I stay up late at night watching infomercials. But wait, there's more. And what are these guys doing? They're demonstrating, but what else are they doing? They're recommending that stuff. You need the Vegematic. It slices, it dices, it it turns cartwheels, you know. And they're recommending that. And that's what Jesus, that's what God the Father does. God the Father comes along and says, you need this kind of love. You really do need it because you're not going to find this type of love anywhere else in the world. In the world, you're going to find a quid pro quo. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. But here's a love that just gives. And when did it happen? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How do you know that you're loved by God or by anyone? Something shows that love, like between a husband or wife or parent and child. It can be a word. It can be a gesture. And the same is true about the cross. The cross shows God's love for us and that Jesus died not when you were at your best. Everything was cleaned up, but when we were at our worst. And finally, the cross defeated our enemy, Satan. The writer of the Hebrews writes this. Since the children have flesh and blood, Jesus too shared in their their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. As we read in Romans 6, it's our union with Jesus Christ, his resurrection that gives us power to live a new kind of life. We no longer have to respond, follow the old way of doing things. We can do something different. We also no longer have to live in cringing fear of what Satan might do to us. He no longer has the power over us. He no longer owns you. I want you to imagine this. Imagine if you rented a house from Satan. I know some of you are. Yeah, I have. (laughs) You know my landlord. (laughs) 
But imagine if the house was owned by Satan. As our landlord, we would constantly be at his beck and call. He could raise the rent. He could ignore the plumbing and the, and, and, and the heating and air conditioning. He could just do it. His demands had to be met. But when you turn your allegiance over to Jesus Christ, when you ask him to forgive your sins and be the leader of your life, your house is now owned by another. It's owned by Jesus Christ. Now what happens is Satan comes over and he starts making the old demands. Hey, rent increase. And you know, some Christians will still jump at that. But it's because of what Jesus did on the cross that you can say, you have no ownership here and shut the door on his demands. No, I'm going to press in to Jesus. Well, we're coming into Easter 2024 and I want, to, I want to ask you this. What do you say to the idea that Easter 2024 can be a watershed point in your life? Perhaps something has been running around in your heart and mind that says, yeah, I want to have all that Jesus promised. I, I'm, and that he paid for with his own life. I don't have it in my life. Can I tell you, it's a very simple matter, although it's not simplistic. But it is simple. Let me just give you three phrases. You first have to acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you've tried to run your own life your own way. What does that mean? You've been playing God. <laughs> You've been playing God. That's what it means. I've been deciding what I should do and how I should do it. I don't care what this God says. I'm God. I'm going to do it. And, and you're just saying, I'm a sinner. I've tried to run. I don't even live up to my own moral code, much less God's moral code. And then second, you believe. Now, the, the word believe is a, a pretty tough word because we, 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 what, what do we think of? We, we think of Peter Pan and Wendy, uh, not Wendy, Tinkerbell is dying, right? And, and Peter Pan tells everybody, believe, believe. And Tinker, you know, Tinkerbell gets all, oh, the, the, the word in the New Testament is the same word for trust. It means to rest your weight on something. You put your trust that what Jesus did on the cross, he did for you. And it takes care of all the remaining issues in your life. Who's going to go with me? What's going to happen when I die? What's going to happen in eternity? How can I change now? And then third, you ask Jesus to come in. Come in, be the leader of my life. Change me from the inside out. That's that third word. Just come in. Be that leader, that person that I can follow because you're worthy of being followed. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. And again, as always, Abba, I thank you for these people who listen so well to, to what, is, what is being said. But Father, every year Easter rolls around with, with all of its stuff, um, all the kind of the same trappings. And Lord, let this Easter be different for us. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for 60, 70 years or you've been a Christian for 60 seconds. Let it be today that things start to change. Maybe for the first time in your life you said, yeah, I want to acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I want to believe, I want to trust that what Jesus did on the cross, he did for me. I want to come into my life and change me from the inside out. Or maybe it's just a renewal of that. Maybe it's just kind of like, like, like Lord, it's, it's kind of like renewing vows to a spouse. People right now are renewing their vows to you, saying, yeah, that's what I believe. That's what I'm trusting. Father, thank you for the solid rock that you've given us. It's not just words. It's not just pithy sayings. But instead, our hope is built on what your son did on the cross. And it's on his name we're going to lean. Thanks, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing one last song before we leave. Mm -hmm.